It's time to uneliminate CRT monitors. All this and more on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Adrian Black says CRTs are back. And what new on about? All this and more coming up on this week's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Morning. Hello. Good day. Oh, Reese is here. I yeah. Am. Again. Welcome back, Reese. Again. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Good to be here. People don't hate you, so we've had you back. Um, how many shows ago was it you were on? It was 10 shows exactly. And the only reason I know exactly that is because of the document that was sent to me that said, uh, you know, episode 136, and the last one was 126, and uh, they're both next so week. It's been three the months then, because we've had the two week break, so it's been three months. Mm. How is your bathroom? It's currently being destroyed, and it, it's the room directly below me. Um, so if you hear any uh, banging noises or uh, anything like that, it's the uh, it's the builder doing his thing. So sorry about that. Sorry, Duncan. Must be going about because Neil had it done as well. His bathroom. Um, I have received this morning a scan doubler for my Amiga. The um, Amiga twelve hundred is with my good friend Pillock, who is recapping it. Uh, he's recapped loads of them, so I thought I'd get him to do it better than me. And he's going to give it a nice ultrasonic bath, so it's lovely and clean. I've got the gubbins to pick up. Gubbins is a good word. I've got gubbins to pick up for the checkmate case, but it's all coming together. I should soon have a fully functional. Um, Nicely beefed up Amiga 1200 um, in a nice black case. I'm not abandoning Atari, Reese. You've I'm not, turned I'm not to the dark side, go. Dave. I've got. I'm, si- I'm sitting next to my Mega STE, which is my favourite. Um, so I'm not. I'm not abandoning it. I don't think. I don't. I actually don't think a, a ST and Amiga. I don't think there needs to be any conflict. They're both fine. I must admit, I went to uh, Kickstart and, and had a, a thoroughly nice time with the Amiga fans. So uh, they're, they're all cool yeah, with me. Nice. <laughs> Great bunch of lads. Um, and also, I've got my floppy Tower of Power progressing. Uh, that actually arrived sometime last week. I've got um, these as well, which um, are PCBs for the Grease Weasel V4. I need to build some of those to run it. So I've got some soldering to do. And I'll have a floppy tower of power. How has your week been, Chris? Yeah, not too bad. Um, been getting into, I know it's not retro enough for some people, but getting back into one of my favourite games, um, Fear, on the Xbox 360. I tried getting back into it on the PC, but it's just not the same because I played through Is it. Is that the one in Chernobyl? First time round. No. I think we had this discussion. Have we had this conversation before? Yeah. Fear. Yeah. Yeah. Why do I it's, think a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a first person, yeah, Stalker, I think is the one you're talking about. It's a first Shadow person horror t- game, oh. sort of very supernatural Japanese style horror uh, in terms of the, the main character. Do you know what it is? It, it's, it's one of those things. Well, what? Do you know what? What is? Stalker spelt the same way S dot T dot, the same way that F dot E dot ah. E dot. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's there you what go. Does Explained. Your head in. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. No, that, that does make sense. But uh, no, I still love it as a game. I think it holds up. But the problem with horror games specifically is replaying Ooh. them is obviously not the same as the first time you play them because the first time you play them, they're scary yeah. and you know what's going to yeah. kill you and when. Yeah. Um, and you yeah. know the times, you know, you, well, you don't know first time through what you can ignore. And this is a game where once you play through it once, you, you realise you can actually ignore some of the jump scares. Not to not to spoil it for anyone, but so now I'm just ploughing through it like an ordinary first person shooter, but it's still good fun. Yeah, it holds up. I like it. Fair enough. Yep. I'm playing Baldur's Gate 3 still, and I will be for, I'm sure, a long time. It's um, it's an incredibly successful game. It's great to see something that's properly a single-player game that that works really well without all sorts of horrible microtransactions going on. We're doing well. Um, you playing anything, Reese? or are you too busy? Um, I'm still slowly working my way through the Rise of the Triad remaster, which came out a few weeks ago, so enjoying that. Dog mode. Woof. Loads of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's dog mode in it please tell me dog mode's in it of course it's in it yeah and and um yeah. shrooms mode and uh, all the other crazy stuff so <laughs> yeah they've done an amazing job of it so obviously it's night dive so it's kind of what you'd expect but yeah, yeah. i'll maybe get around to that eventually um Very cool. shall we move on to housekeeping oh let's do that to the wonderful to the wonderful 
quick summary on how this works. People go to our subreddit uh, and they submit stories for us to talk about. And people, other people go in and they hit the up button to say that they like a story, that, that they should be talked about. And um, that, it works really well, except for this week. This week's top submission is from Senior by 445 with the title Digital Crocs. And it's just a picture of someone with Crocs with, with Pac-Men stuck on it. That's it. <laughs> That's a story, Dave. Why are we not covering yeah. that? <laughs> I, I don't know talk. if it's... I don't know if it's aimed at me because people know I wear Crocs about the house. I wear Crocs about the house in the garden. I don't if I'm if I'm getting in the car, if I'm going anywhere, I'll, I'll change. But um, they're very comfortable. They're ideal, and you can wash them. But yeah, Crocs nice. was our top story this week. A picture of Crocs with the four Pac Men on it. Ne Reese, what are the names of them? Name the Pac Men. Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clive. Clyde. That's right. Well done. Like that. Yeah. Wow. Like that. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Dasha, Blitzen, Grumpy. Sleepy. Yeah. I don't know the Japanese um, names. Are the Japanese names? They, they they have different names in Japan, and and one of them translates as like idiot or something. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <God. laughs> <Bit> um, harsh. <laughs> that, might so thank you for that. that. Yeah. Thank you for submitting that. Um, I'd also like to wel welcome two new patrons, Harsh and Paul. Thank you very much for signing up. Um, if you do want to join them. Um, then please go to www.patreon.com slash thisweekinretro and you can sign up and join them uh, and help us cover the costs associated with this podcast. So that's all for housekeeping this week. Well, I'm actually going to kick off this week with some depressing regret, but hopefully end on a high note. So Dr. Local shared a link in the subreddit to a story on nintendolife.com that's all about regretting getting rid of our games from the past. Um, of course, they're talking about Nintendo games, so if that's your jam, head over to the link via the show notes. See that the writers and staff, Gavin Lane, Jim Norman, Alana Hagues, and Ollie Reynolds, lamenting over games like Fire Emblem, The Sacred Stones, Panzer Dragoon Saga, and a mint-boxed copy of Rogue Squadron, to name a few. And one of them also discusses specific special edition consoles that they've chosen to pass on only to regret sometime later. And of course, part of that regret, as they do discuss, is seeing the current value of some of these gems, as well as, of course, the nostalgia that's attached to them. Um, and I think we can all relate. But, you know, the, the reasons that we get got rid of games in the past is often justified. You know, we either needed the cash to buy more games or, you know, trading games in for other games at the shop. Um, selling a system and the games that get, went with it to buy the next big thing when the one that you've got is outdated, selling to buy beer, selling because we think we've grown up, and, of course, selling because we're hopelessly addicted to Laser Quest and the game shop around the corner from the arena was paying <laughs> just enough SNES cartridge to get us into another game of Laser Tag so that we could rack up our league points by shooting kids in the back on their birthday. I know we can definitely all relate to the last one. Um and of course, it's not just the loss of the game, but the box, the manuals, and all those wonderful things we now crave because they're actually missing from modern games. Um, you know, things like keyboard overlays, maps, um, uh, novels, trinkets, posters, and even just the quality of the box and the art itself. So, guys, what was your favourite boxed game of all time that you've banished in the past? And, and what happened to it? And why did you ditch it? And, and actually, have you repurchased it? Um, Dave? Well, um, not only have I done it, but I've bought the T-shirt. Um, it was, I think, on balance, it's probably Ultima 6. Uh, but I threw, or it was thrown this, Ultima 5 and Ultima 7, were all thrown out. My dad phoned me one day and he said, all these old computer games up the loft, I'm going to take them to dump unless you really want them. Uh, do you want to come around and get them? He's like, nah, it's all right. So he took them all to the dump. Um, oh. And I didn't have that many box games, for the, particularly for the ST uh, and for the PC. I didn't have that many box games. Um, I tended to pirate them, but I liked having those particular games because um, those games started when you touched the box 
So you had the box art, you had the stuff on the back, but importantly, you had inside, you had the, the map to fold out, and you had the um, you had two manuals in there, the compendium, and you had the the reference guide. Um, so I also you had where is it? The most important thing, an orb of the moons. For Ultima, oh. um, I actually didn't particularly. I, I thought that that even back in the day, I thought those trinkets were a bit a bit naff. But the manual, the map, and so on, they really helped you. They really made you enjoy the game more. So the game started when you had those things. So going back to it these days, you've got them in PDF. It's not quite the same. Um, but not all games of that period were like that. I can think back to Another World on the ST or Power Monger or Killing Game Show. Those all had intros, so when you loaded the game, the game started when the game loaded up, and they had the intro to get you sucked in there, so you didn't need the box for those, so the box didn't really add to the experience. I think the ones, the, the best ones before that, though, before Ultima, the ones that are the most famous are Infocom games, so those, those are the text adventures from the early 80s, and they... When when Infocom games came out, although they were text adventures, they were still limited for space on the disc, so they had extra um, novellas or brochures or leaflets or, or maps, other stuff that came with those games, um, with those Infocom games that really helped the experience, feelies and browsies it's called, and it really helped the experience. So those are the kind of things that um, I, I think are, are the best things to have. Funny enough, LucasArts games, um, they're, they're, uh, everybody pays a lot of money for those, but I don't think they're that attractive because... They, the game starts, Monkey Island starts when you load the game and you get the intro to it then. It's, it's not so much... There's the, there's the Find a Pirate um, wheel, this copy protection wheel, but that's really it in the box. So the, the, for, for those, it's the, the, the box isn't, isn't as important. Um, so but I, I did, of course, buy them all back, and I bought the T-shirt, and I bought all the Ultimas now, uh, and I, I, I really wish I had my original copies. That would be, it'd be nice to have the originals rather than someone else's now. That's true. Dave, for those of you listening, Dave is actually wearing an Ultimate 6 T-shirt, so he's literally bought the T-shirt. What about yourself, Reese? Yeah, I mean, similar to Dave, I didn't really have big box games on the Atari ST. Um, a lot of them were on like the, the Pompey Pirates compilation discs and, and that kind of stuff with the, uh, the old crack throws and things, and, and that was kind of my earliest experience. I love those discs. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've kind of started collecting them again. Um, I think the, the only actual boxed games that we had were the Hit Squad, uh, like budget re-releases. Um, I mean, we were quite late to the ST, so um, by that point, so, sort of all of the big games on the platform were kind of available as, as budget releases. Also started collecting those now as well. It's not a bad thing to collect. It's not, it's not a bad idea to collect those because they're not, they're not too expensive. Yeah, that's the thing. You, you can usually pick up kind of bundles of them on eBay for uh, not a lot of money, so... Um, but when it comes to when it comes to big box games, obviously PC uh, in the '90s was kind of my era. So Duke Nukem and Quake and Carmageddon and all that kind of stuff. And in my case, we threw the boxes out, but we kept the actual discs in the jewel cases, uh, which is even more depressing because I've got a big box in the loft with all of the old original games in the jewel cases, and um, we've not got the boxes or the manuals or anything. So. Uh, Yet again, yep, I'm, I've also uh, been bitten by the same collecting bug and uh, felt the need to go out and uh, replenish all of those, uh, as well as some others that uh, I kind of wanted back in the day but never had. So, uh, yeah, but uh, they, they do look good on the shelf, if nothing else. There is something about those games that came with jewel cases in the kind of CD era. Have you noticed that some of the games, the box for them is really just a sleeve? Mm. And once you've opened it up, you find out the manual's actually in the jewel case, mm. in which case the jewel case has everything you need and the box is just it's pretty superfluous. And that's why I think a lot of those boxes were thrown out because once you got the once you got the jewel case out, the jewel case was all that really mattered. A bit of a shame as well, because the manual in a jewel case feels a bit a, a bit a bit stingy. I'd rather have a full size manual in it. Yeah, I think uh, I think Duke Nukem 3D, it is literally just an empty box with the uh you know, with, with the disc inside. Yeah, I think Quake has a quite a nice that. comprehensive manual with it. Um, but that's obviously that's in software, so that's kind of their thing. 
Um, I'm just, I, I had to grin when you said about hit squads because I know there's a, a guy called Dave Birdsaw, I think it is. Um, what's his channel? Dave Retro Games Played Badly, and he was after them. <laughs> it, it was actually Spectrum hit squads. Uh, he was trying to complete the set, and yeah, hit squads are not necessarily easy to find, depending on if it's that last one that you need for your collection. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. His the the spectrum ones are in the the kind of the the clear cassette yeah. cases, but the ones that Reese is collecting for his ST are in these small cardboard boxes. They're they're, yeah, they're quite. Okay. It's quite a, quite an unusual form factor, really. It's oh, got these, I know the these ones. slim square ones. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they were the You'll same on the Amiga. Down, yeah. I've got I've got a couple. Yeah, I've got at least one. Yeah. I'm trying to think. But they're, they're good to collect. As long as you're not, Kicks it's when you try and complete the set that you have the problem. Gary Gary Pinkett, uh, he, he famously had to pay through the nose to get Puff. It was one of the Puff, Puff games. with DJ Puff, that's it. Paying a fortune for that one just to complete the set. And it, it, that's the danger of collecting these as you get to the you get to the point where you suddenly realise, hang on, I've nearly got them all. I don't want to get <laughs> And you start looking at the expensive ones, yeah don't want to get into collecting any of these sets um in terms of boxes i regret getting rid of i think um the first one that comes to mind would be unreal because i didn't realize at the time and i think i'm correct in saying you had the outer box the big box and then you had obviously the cd in its jewel case which had its own artwork but they weren't all the same they actually did different versions of that so to actually collect the exact one that you bought would actually be quite difficult unless you got that you know, good a memory because the one that you see on eBay might not actually be the same inner artwork. Mm. Just these little things that make such a difference when you're trying to recapture, you know, the, the, the one, the exact one that you had. Um, and I have repurchased Unreal, but it's just the CD in the case. There's no, there's no big box around it and no manual or anything like that. But um, that would be closely followed by Frontier. And that's simply because of that awesome massive galaxy map that came with it and um also all the books and, and the novels the short yeah. stories of life on the frontier um it's absolutely yeah. fantastic but again they make a actually, big difference yeah they, they make a huge difference and, and that one hasn't it hasn't gone crazy in terms of the price i had the pc version and the easiest one i actually found to recollect ironically is the amiga version so that's the version i've got on the shelf i don't care it's the same game there's loads of the Amiga yeah. version around, and I don't, I yeah. don't, I don't know why all the Amiga people bought them. Is, is it because of the, is it because of the manuals in there, and because you had the map in there, it made it more a more compelling buy than a pirate? I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, loads I, around. Yeah, and and I say this as an avid Amiga fan, as everybody knows, but it it pay, played terribly on the Amiga unless you had, um, you know, uh, well, even on the twelve hundred, it struggles. You you really need. An 030 at least. Um, it really does struggle on the Amiga. Much as we love it, um, but I had a PC by the time that came out, so it didn't really matter. Um, right, in the notes, I've just got a name here, and it says Tim, because I haven't told you to go, uh, about this either. Um, but I've, I've got a mate called Tim. When I first got back into this recollecting, um, I mentioned it to a friend, and he said, oh, I've got a heap of games you can have. They're PC games. Um, and so we went round his house that very same day because i like to jump on these things when people say i've got some games you can have you've got to got to jump on it otherwise it won't happen and he said yeah we've got the boxes and everything not a problem let me show you the boxes so what tim had done (laughs) was basically destroy all the boxes to save space so they've all been shred uh basically cut up so i've got rally pro pro 2001 here what what i'm holding up here for those of you listening is basically just the flat pack version of the box. So he's cut the front and the back of the box. So you still got the back art, you still got the artwork, but it doesn't take up the shelf space, you see. So you got the front of the box and you got the back of the box and, and in there you, if it had a manual, you've also got the manual. All the all the CDs and stuff are on the shelf. But at some point in his life he'd gone, I don't want to get rid of the boxes, but it takes up too much room. And this was the solution. So all these boxes, that was I mean Rally Pro 2001, who really cares about that? Probably somebody out there does. Um Riven. Um, Supercars Race Driver. Probably don't really care too much about that. Fairly recent. Need for Speed. Need for Speed. Oh, I understand he's thinking that. Microprose. The the thing is, though, lots of people did had the same thoughts and then just threw out the boxes. So again, talking about the dual cases. Yeah, they they threw out the the boxes. I'm, yeah. gl- I'm glad he's. I'm glad he's doing that. Five years, not five years before that, but when you get to the more expensive and valuable games, the more rare yeah. ones. Um, I mm-hmm. understand why he's done it. Oh, but it looks terrible. It does. <laughs> but like you say, 
And I remember I doing the same thing is you chuck the boxes out and you kept the CDs. But what you were talking about there, Dave, is you didn't necessarily need it. I'll Before we move on from Tim, I will redeem him. He did also have this, which is a beautiful full box of F22 um, with the manual and everything can feel the weight of this. Give it a rattle. That that was complete. That was saved, as were a couple of others. But yeah, most of the boxes were crushed essentially. Yeah, I was just going to say you could um, you could maybe frame those and put them on the wall. It might look quite cool. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. We've, we've missed. I'd probably do that. Microsoft Flight Simulator. Some of the others will come into their own eventually. But yeah, they're, they're, they're posters. They they would make good posters. Oh, what is this? Dave's holding up essentially the same sort of idea, isn't it? Is that obsession? Yeah, so this is Obsession for the STE and the Falcon. I think it's a work in the STE as well. It's a, it's a kind of fairly late-era pinball game. It's really good. But the good thing here is oh. Oh. it's the sleeve from the box. So all I need to do oh. is get a box, and I can put the, the discs and the manual are there. I bought it on eBay not realizing that the box was missing. But I guess the in this case, because it's a sleeve, all I need to do is find a box that's identical in size, and I've got I've got obsession boxed. Yeah, and it's good enough for me. I thought that's what you thought that was you were showing me. I thought it was the sleeves you were showing me rather than the, no, rather no, than they're crushed boxes. Off. So I, I did Ugh. say I, I did try and say I'd end on a, this story on a high note. So let's let's try and move on to that before people unsubscribe because <laughs> we're showing destroyed boxes <laughs> from PC big box games. So, Pajaco6502 dropped a link into an online repository of 3D Big Box games for you to browse through. Uh, Bigboxcollection.com is well worth checking out. It contains interactive 3D images of heaps of Big Box games from various systems, um, and, and many will show you the contents of the boxes as well. You basically click on a little link, and it gives you a 2D image of what should be in the box, although I must say it's got Barbarian 1 and 2 in there, and neither of them had the poster. I've got both posters. So happy. Um, and thank you, Rich, for one of those. Um, but it, it appears to be a, a really great uh, uh, collection of games. Uh, and it, uh, I think the website is uh, the creation of uh, games collector and blogger Benjamin Wimmer from Austria. And he's done a great job of presenting these rotatable, zoomable 3D models of games boxes for you to look at and reminisce over. I took interest in this straight away because I actually did a little bit of 3D objects for web in the early noughties using Macromedia Shopwave plugin when that was a thing. Um, so this this kind of stuff always piques my interest. Um, have you guys had a look uh, and what do you think? And are there any games that you'd like to see Benjamin add to this virtual collection that you haven't seen there, Reese? Yes, I did have a look. Um, like you say, it's impressive with all the, the 3D models and how you can kind of rotate them and see all the sides of the boxes. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time on there because uh, I did find myself very tempted to go straight over to eBay and uh, start picking up some things that are <laughs> missing from my collection. So true. Uh, but one of the first ones that, that jumped out at me was uh, Seventh Guest, which I've actually got here, um, just because it's designed to look like a book, which I thought always thought was really cool. And uh, this is my original box copy. I see Dave's holding up uh, something very similar. Yeah, I know when you said you were going to do that, I noticed I've got one called Fable, and it's done the same way. It's printed with slightly, it's printed like a book, basically, to look like a book. It's quite clever. That's really nice. Fable's not as um, not as famous a game by any means. Uh, I saw this, I actually saw this website a couple of years ago. Um, I sometimes think about, I sometimes play in my head with the idea of making my own personal reproduction boxes for games. Um, I'm not actually bothered if a game box is original or not i'm not i'm not really in it for counting up how much money i've got on my shelves in fact i'd be happy if all this was worth nothing um not not that i paid for it but i'd be happy if you could you, you could get this for this for nothing um but for me it's, it's about the functional aspect of it the, the idea of enjoying the game better because you've got the box there so i, I did intend to make for example some of my Ultima boxes are really quite badly damaged, Ultima 2 and 3, for example. And I'm not going to get better copies of those because they're already extremely expensive. But I quite fancy the idea of printing a slightly larger box to put those into to keep the, the, the Tati originals um, in best shape as possible, but also to match the rest of the Ultima ones on the shelf, for example. And there's a compilation of games that I have 
that never had a box. It came just kind of cellophane wrapped with the CDs and the manual. I'd like to make a box for that um, to go in the shelf. Uh, the Lord of the Rings series, I've talked about that on, on this before. The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings Part 1, Shadows of Mordor, Cracks of Doom. They all come in, in, in vastly different form factors. A kind of a, a folder for Lord of the Rings. There's the, the box for The Hobbit. There's um, there's the the cassette for uh, Shadows of Mordor and Cracks of Doom is is different again. So I'd like to make one box that takes them all for myself to go in my shelf for myself. So I, I like the idea there. So that's what inspired me when I looked at this website, and I wonder if 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 um, what he's got there would would be suitable to help people create their own reproduction boxes because I'm really not opposed to reproduction boxes. I think it's uh, as long as people aren't trying to pass them off. Uh, as real, then I, I I like the idea of that. No, that's cool. I think this could actually be a great resource, and, and I I love to see more detail about what each box should contain. If in, if I wanted to see anything added, it would be more detail like that. Um, and it serves two purposes really, as a check to see what a complete game looks like if you're a collector and you're still trying to buy some of this stuff, and also a place to enjoy these games and all the games that we let go without breaking the bank because you could, you could just go there and choose to not buy them. <laughs> Just look at them in virtual reality, um, kind of. So check out both the links in the show notes, uh, and thank you always for your submissions. We are sponsored by Pixel Addict Magazine. Pixel Addict Magazine have just come out with issue 14, so go ahead and buy it. Uh, this one, uh, the front cover, has um, a competition pro with the... It's on the red carpet. It looks as like if it's, it's had its rubber feet cut off, but it's on, it's, it's on the red carpet. And the, the headline story this month is Celebrity Gamers. It's talking about gamers uh, who were into retro or profess a love of, 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 of those retro games or consoles. And it's quite an interesting subject because these days there's nothing wrong with admitting you like or confessing that you like uh, playing uh, games now there's no one no one ashamed of it everyone's happy to do it but if you go back to the 90s uh, it certainly wasn't the case games were not looked at uh, in the same way that they are now and i remember nintendo and playstation ran quite aggressive adverts trying to reverse that trying to make them look cool and edgy and when you look back now the adverts are quite uh, quite uh, offensive um, at times uh, what, with what they've done about uh, misogyny and so on and sexism and so on. But yeah, uh, back then so the, 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 um, it wasn't quite as a, as appealing to admit you're a gamer. So I'm quite looking forward to reading that. The, the, the magazine's not quite out yet. You can pre-order it as we're recording, but I think by the time this, this uh, episode comes out, you'll be able to buy it. Um, you can go to the website, which Chris will tell you is, pixel.addict.media where you can subscribe to get it as a PDF, get it delivered to your house or you can go to your local butchers or candlestick maker and get it there. Uh, Reese. Do you read Pixel Addict magazine? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I do still read Pixel Addict magazine. Yeah, um, I've also written some stuff for them. What was the last thing you wrote for them? Um, it was the. Um, I, I was actually interviewed by uh, by Andrew about my YouTube channel and collection oh, yeah, and stuff like yeah. that. Um, but I, I actually wrote an article on the Atari Panther as well, which was a, uh, yeah. a, a prototype yeah. console that was that was cancelled and never made it to market. So, yeah. Yeah. Comes out every six weeks, so it's time for the new one there. Go ahead and buy it. Thank you very much for sponsoring us. Around a year ago, the RMC Discord admins were chatting amongst ourselves because one of us had found a supposedly brand newly made CRT on sale on AliExpress or another similar site. We didn't believe it. Now, we didn't know what it was, whether it was new old stock, whether it was refurbished or recased old stock, whether it was maybe they, they, they were those massive call centers with these and they were taking them out and putting them in new cases and adding a, a control board. We didn't know. We thought they might be LCDs described as CRTs, but it wasn't actually a CRT. But none of us, not one of us believed it was a brand new made CRT. Now, one of us did try to get them and they spoke to someone about it and it kind of fizzled out. I think they were only interested in large volumes and they were baffled why someone in the UK was looking for it. Um, and we, we forgot about it. We were convinced it wasn't real, so we thought it was just uh, never going to happen anyway. 
And we have talked about CRTs on before. In fact, we've recently talked about a device for old PCs to help them switch to using modern displays as best as they can without the conversion to analog and then back again to digital and adding the noise that that does. And I love CRTs. I really do love CRTs. I've got loads of them. Um, and our guest today has even more CRTs than I do. I think I have around 20. Reese has even more. I think you've, you used to count them, but now you don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was 17 at last count, but that was a couple of years ago. So they just seem to multiply. It's going to be at least double that now. Probably. Yeah. Um, now, there's something magical about it. But we need to keep it realistic. They have lots and lots of problems. They're big, they're whine, they, they whine, they're bulky, they're heavy, you need a deeper desk to use them. They aren't as easy on the eyes for text, but for the lower resolution stuff, they look magic. Nothing looks the same. I don't think I ever want to give up on CRTs for the Amstrad, the ST, and for um, arcade games. Uh, the PC, I could probably live without um, but I still have still got a big 20, 21 inch one for the PCs, but nothing looks the same as a CRT. And that brings us on to this week's submission from I Am Amiga. It's an Adrian Black video. And for those of you unaware, um, Adrian runs a, a great YouTube channel uh, where he does really detailed repairs. He's got a very pleasant voice to listen to. He's very relaxing. Um, you can watch him and he'll put you at ease. Um, everybody seems to like Adrian. Um, does a great channel though he's, he's recently gone full time on YouTube as well I think now he's found a board on AliExpress that goes inside a CRT it's a replacement board for the gubbins for the guts of a CRT and it wasn't too expensive I looked and it was about 40 quid on there so not too expensive so maybe $50 if you're in America so he gave it a try and ordered it and it arrived and he took what he called a junk CRT and he tried to swap out the board. So before, so the idea is you would you would change, you would keep the tube, the, so the, the, the high voltage tube you would keep, but everything else with the CRT you would replace. Um, so before I, I talk about how his results were, let's talk about what I was thinking. I thought if this exists, then perhaps maybe we'll have a way to turn a dead CRT into a working CRT. I think most of the time when a CRT goes, it's not the tube itself, although the tubes can fade, they can get uh, burning and so on, but it's not the tube that fails, it, it, it's the gubbins inside. So I'm no, in no way a CRT expert, so I don't know what percentage of failures, the failures this will cover, but is it, enough, is it fair to say 75% of dead CRTs could be revived with a new board? I don't know. Um, but my question was, is it actually good enough? Because a bad CRT is not better than a modern LCD. Only a good CRT is worth it. If you get a CRT where it looks as if someone smeared the screen with Vaseline, if if you can't really see it very properly, or if it's got if it's got if it's been used as a a CCTV and it's got lines and so on on it, and it really bothers you when you're using it, is it that that good? And I'm sure we've all seen arcade machines where the CRT, where the arcade machine has not been well looked after, and the CRT looks awful. So those those aren't really those aren't great. But if this is good enough, then maybe maybe it could mean that all those lovely Atari and Commodore monitors that match the micros could be could be uh, saved. Um, I don't know how wide a range it can be used on. And then I thought about another project, and it's one I've got to do myself. It's the GBS 8220. So the GBS 8220 is a small, dirt cheap upscaler. It takes a VGA signal and it scan doubles it. So you can use the signal on a modern monitor, whereas the old uh, signals were in 15 kilohertz. You need to be 30 or 31 kilohertz to use a modern monitor. So this GBS board is a, it's small, it's dirt cheap. It's a bit cheap and nasty. It was never the, the output was never great. And you could do a few things. Neil, for example, had a video on it years and years ago where you put slug tape in the back and slug tape has got copper on it and that helps to cut out interference. It made the signal slightly better. But there's a project called GBS Control. And when you put a, a microcontroller onto this, when you add it to it for, for about a fiver, it turns it from a, a cheaper, nasty upscaler to 
probably if you if you if you're looking to get VG output from it, probably as good as you could hope to get. It's a really really good product just from that. And I was thinking, I wonder if, the, if these PCBs, if they become ubiquitous, if there's a lot of these around, do we end up with a similar mod for those to make sure they can take HDMI and other things to make them into great CRTs? I don't know. Maybe we could end up with CRT running forever. So my mind went kind of away on a tangent on this video with uh, what might be. But first of all, Reese. Do you fancy trying this yourself? I know you've you, you've worked with CRTs before, and I know you're brave enough to do it. Would you want to change the gubbins of your CRTs to bring them back together again? Yeah, um, I, I really enjoyed this video, as always, from Adrian. Uh, you know, very knowledgeable guy, and uh, always fascinating to watch him tinkering with this with this stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I have um, I actually have a main arcade cabinet that has a, a CRT in it. Um, it's, it's actually a, out of one of those. Mega Touch quiz machines that uh, you have in pubs here, and uh, I, I took the uh, I took the touch uh, sensitive panel off the front of it, and uh, it's, it's a really good CRT. But it does potentially need recapping and a new flyback, which I bought. Uh, you know, you can you can replace the flyback transformer in them. Uh, but yeah, it does make me wonder. Actually, you know, perhaps I'm wasting my time with that, and that's that's a huge amount of work. And maybe it's just easier to just put one of these universal boards in there, and then it's got all modern internals and um yeah perhaps perhaps a better alternative to uh, kind of refurbishing the original boards obviously um you know they're getting a bit old and flaky now and you've got bad solder joints on them and uh, perhaps a better option just to start again from scratch with something brand new i'm not brave at messing about with crts i've already got one it's a tv and the picture's slightly off because it's moved inside and i'm not even brave enough to open it up and realign that because <laughs> i've heard too many people have you know, too many stories of how dangerous CRTs are inside. So this is not my bag. Um, but anything that helps people, other people with more skills than myself, uh, preserve what they love is a good thing. So this sounds like a fantastic thing if it works well. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised when I first came back into this hobby, um, I was became surprised that there, uh, uh, you know, after learning of how many modern replacements we've got for things like, you know, floppy drives and, you know, different PCBs and accelerators and all of that, that there currently isn't a CRT replacement. And that sort of continued to sort of um, surprise me, but I'm slowly understanding why, you know, the complexities and the cost for what is a, an incredibly niche market. I mean, I think you'd be talking about a really expensive product if somebody did do a full brand new CRT. Yeah, well, it, these these apparently are, are are not expensive, and it's because they're for um, markets where there's not a lot of money going around, and it was to get things working again in in places like India and Malaysia and so on in China. Um, I'm I'm really interested to find out if if these CRTs we looked at before, if they're real, if there are new CRTs being made. And what's the story with them? Because I, I've been told that CRTs aren't being made and it, it's it's never going to happen again because the size of factory needed and the tooling up for it would be really expensive. But maybe there is an old factory that made them that's, that's still running, that's still churning these out um, as cheaply as they can. I don't know. Um, as for how Adrian's video went, it's not quite plug and play. You need to move a few connectors around to suit your tube. You need to somehow fit it inside as well. And the buttons need to go in the right place. Uh, and when his came, one of the capacitors had a dry joint on it. Where it, um, it was a great big heavy capacitor. So in shipping, it had, it had knocked the solder off there. So a, a bit of a soldering iron for a couple of seconds would fix that easily enough. But these these were clearly not uh, premium things. These were these were made as cheap as they can to get all tech still running. Um, we've had Stephen Jones's Checkmate monitor, and that's an LCD in a, a case that makes it look much more like a CRT. Um, and I've not kept up with the the, the Kickstarter process uh, progress, and I didn't back it. But I think people should be getting them. I think sometime soon, maybe later on this year. But if these new CRT tubes exist maybe the boards can be adjusted to get a better and more compatible with uh, more signals. Maybe we can get a, a brand new high quality CRT monitor for retro that accepts RGB and super video and composite. Maybe it can do everything. I, I don't know. I think that the, the problem I see is cost. Uh, most CRTs that I see people buying are either for free because it's difficult to sell them so people just give them away, or it, it, it's under a couple of hundred pounds. And I, I'm not saying 200 pounds is a small amount of money, but 
it's pretty much as much as they see them as they go, even for a nice one. So how much would people be prepared to pay for a brand new one, which is assuming it's it's something from AliExpress taken and then reworked into a new case with with extra stuff on to make it better. I, I'm not sure that, that could be done. Um, but now Adrian does talk about um, how ugly the box for the CRT is. So he's talking about the television that he used to replace it on the he said it, he said it is bulbous looking. He's quite right. These televisions of that particular area, the, 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 the design language on them has not aged well. They look they look bad. They don't look very nice at all. And how he liked to have it in a wood case, although he says he's got no experience with woodworking. But I reckon maybe a wood cased CRT if you can take one of these ones and do it that way, it might be nice. I don't know. As you guys know, I'm now the proud owner of a Commodore CDTV, and you'll note I did not say Amiga, as Commodore never branded it as such, and in fact went to great lengths to separate the two. Um, the CDTV, if you're not aware, looked like a CD player, not like a console or a computer, and was designed to look at a home in a hi-fi stack which is why I've not used mine much at all, because I'm waiting to complete the full lounge room setup as Commodore intended. Um, Dave? But it is an Amiga, though. It's, it's, it's an Amiga 500 with a CD, isn't it? Yes. Back in the day, though, CD, the CDTV failed um, and has only now really emerged as, coming to that point, Dave, as probably the best-looking Amiga, in inverted commas, ever made, in my opinion, um, but I think quite a few other people uh, agree with that statement. It came out in 1991, which I think shows how forward-thinking des the design really was. It wasn't even beige, it was black. Cool. How futuristic. Um, uh, and integrating gaming and education with the home entertainment system rather than being a standalone oddity. Fast forward to 2000, which was unquestionably the year of the PlayStation 2, and we see the same concept re-emerge. The PS2 was a monolith of black and featured not CD this time, but an integrated DVD player, of course. So it could play games as its primary function, but also music CDs and movie DVDs. And it looked black enough to sit in the lounge room of the time and blend in, but different enough to clearly be a console. But before the PS2, there was another stab at this concept. So in July of 2000, um, a DVD player hit the market, backed by Toshiba, and looking just like any Toshiba DVD player, only this player was called the Nuon. Sporting a 128-bit, 750-megahertz Ares 2 or 3 CPU and N64-like controllers, as well as the normal infrared remote, this DVD player was actually a console. And to look at it at a glance, you'd never know, just like how you'd hardly know the CDTV was actually an Amiga. If you look at the gameplay footage, though, which obviously you can now look up online on YouTube for, for any of the new on games, uh, and there were only ga eight games released, by the way, you'd be forgiven for mistaking that they're actually N64 games. That's the kind of level of graphic that you're looking at and that this thing seems to put out. Uh, but for the time, that's not a bad thing, because when you think about it, 2000, the N64 was only just about to bow out to the PS2 after all. So in context, this thing kind of looked current. Uh, the games for the new on were Tempest 3000, Freefall 3050 AD, Merlin Racing, which is like a Mario Kart clone, Space Invaders XL, Iron Soldier 3, Ballistic, but that was only available on the Samsung-based players, uh, the next Tetris DLX, which was only available for the Toshiba players, and Crayon Shichan 3, which apparently was a Korean-only release. And as you can tell by the list there, it gets a bit complicated because the new on console was actually released in several versions backed by other technology giants such as Samsung. Um, and in fact, there's quite a list of DVD players that were actually new ones available on Wikipedia. So we'll make sure that link is added to the show notes as well so you can look those up. Um, you, you might get lucky. Somebody might be selling you know, a DVD player on Marketplace and you find out you know, you've just bagged a new one. Personally, the only thing I didn't like about the PS2 was the fact that it didn't have an LCD plan panel, which seems like a simple thing. So if I chose to use it as a CD player through my hi-fi, I still needed to turn on the TV in order to navigate through the tracks. And that just seemed like such a stupid omission uh, to me at the time. And that's why I love things like the CD TV and now the new one. Uh, by looking like a piece of hi-fi and with the simple inclusion of the LCD panel, they, they can do both jobs perfectly well. So, guys, 
Were you aware of the new one? And what is it with well-integrated consoles that look like pieces of hi-fi always failing to sell? Yeah. Um, I mean, the interesting thing about the new one is there's some Atari Jaguar DNA in there. Um, I'm not ex- exactly sure what the, the sort of the hardware connection is. Um, but of course, Iron Soldier 3 came out on there, as did Tempest 3000, which was developed by Jeff Minter, who did uh, Tempest 2000 on, on the Jaguar. So... Um, yeah, um, and I think as far as I know, actually, Tempest was pretty much the only decent game on there, very similar to the Jaguar. Um, but uh, it, I think that the thing about the new one is it, it, it was the controllers that let it down. Um, obviously, you mentioned that uh, there, was, there was like an N64-style controller available for it, but I think I think they were really, really rare, um, and most people actually played it with the infrared remote, which just wasn't ideal for gaming at all. So, yeah, that, that's pretty much my entire uh, entire knowledge on the new one. Actually, that's what impre- this isn't about the CDTV, but the CDTV IR controller is actually really good. I'm, I'm, I'm actually astonished by how responsive it is. But anyway, Dave? I am aware of it, but only because a few weeks ago I watched a Tech Moan video. Um, he had an excellent video called The Curse of the New One, in which he spends lots of money and lots of effort trying to make a video on them and encounters lots of failures. Um he did eventually get it working. It, it's a wonderful video. I, I I really enjoy watching Tecmo and his charisma and humor really come across great. And this is a this is a really of all the Tecmo videos, this is a really Tecmo and Tecmo video. Um, so it's one to, to watch. Um, but basically, this seems to come from a time when PCs had gone super super mainstream, and there was a drive to get them into living rooms. And I wasn't aware of the new one at the time. Or in fact, I wasn't even aware of the CDTV. Uh, I wasn't aware of that. But I was aware of HTPC, so that's home theater PCs. And there was lots of of really attractive um, but expensive cases designed for getting a home theater PC in your living room. And it was a bit of an enthusiast thing. PC enthusiasts were doing it because it was an excuse to buy another PC and do another build on a PC for the living room. But they didn't really catch on. The, the, people didn't. People weren't buying HTPCs. Um, but I think we've got them now. If you look at most people's living rooms, if you look at a Sky or a Virgin TV box, or if, if you're not in the UK, you'll have something similar, I'm sure. Um, what you've got is it, most of the time there's a hard drive in there. So most of the time it's, it'll record stuff, and it'll play stuff, and it'll stream media for you. So they kind of got there by stealth, these things. Um, but there was a battle fought as well with consoles to get in the living room. Because consoles, I mentioned this earlier on about celebrity gamers, um, consoles weren't that welcome in the living room in the 90s until all of a sudden they were. And maybe it's around the time of the PlayStation 2 when it was just routine to have them there because they played DVDs. Uh, but they, they they fought that battle and they won. So consoles now happily live in the living room and eight home theater PCs don't. And this is this is kind of a take on that. I think this is one of the kind of uh, the points where the technology makers thought they were on to what was definitely, definitely, definitely going to be the next big thing. And they were they were going to get this this out and they had this open design and several hardware manufacturers doing it and nobody was interested. And it just flopped. Did you guys so go back to now like the sixteen bits of Atari ST for you guys and and even before that you know with your Amstrad, Amstrad CPCs or for me the Spectrum and the uh, the Commodore Amiga after that did you like have to sneak into the lounge with your computer if you wanted to use the big TV in the house was that your reality as it was was it just me um, I never did it with the ST and I don't know why but the the Amstrad the C, the Amstrad CPC came with its own monitor and the monitor was great. I mean, it really was a fantastic monitor, and you couldn't plug it into a TV very easily, so there's never the appeal there. But the ST, I'm sure I've done it once or twice, but it was never. Uh, but yeah, I, I, th- I hear more about it when people doing the uh, the, the twenty six hundred and things like that. Reese, yeah, I mean, our first computer was an Acorn Electron, and that was set up on the uh, the, the living room TV, and, and it, it got to a point where I was just hogging the TV, you know, coming home from school, and I was just on it until <laughs> until dinner time, and. Um, I think my parents got so annoyed with it that uh, by, by the time they got me uh, the ST, I had a, a TV in my bedroom as well, so I could kind of hide away up there and and use it on my own without bothering everyone else. Yeah, nice. Now, in my house, the computers were not welcome in the lounge, so I had to mm. 
even some Saturday mornings, I wake up before anybody else, and especially before my dad, <laughs> before he he turned on whatever shows he wanted to watch, and that's when I'd get to use the big TV, which was the only color TV in the house, you know. So that's that's really <laughs> most a lot of my gaming experience was actually in black and white until eventually mm. my brother got a color TV in the bedroom. But anyway, I can think of, and in fact, it predates both of those that we just mentioned as well. Um, I can think of one console that was designed, I think, to match the sitting room or the living room decor of the period and to blend into the other technology of the time and it didn't fail and it was a huge success any guesses as to what i'm about to pick up guys um the Amstrad gx 4000 <laughs> no the 3do no the atari it doesn't blend in oh. even on any I, planet <laughs> i was <laughs> i was gonna say 2600 yeah 2600 yeah yeah good guess yeah i'd, I'd say the very first well the vcs Absolutely. Oh. You've got the wood grain, you've got the metal switches. Oh, you've got one right there on the desk. I've, I've got two. And, you know, <laughs> in, in that's that's what the TV looked like. That's what the stereo mm. looked like. That's what the technology in the lounge looked like. And keeping in mind, this is kind of, well, I don't want to say, because I'm not you know, that up on hi-fi gear, but I do know there was a period, and it was in the 70s for some of it as well, where hi-fis weren't necessarily in stacks. They were actually laid out side by side on a on a like countertop. So you had like your, your, your tape deck and then you'd have your record player next to it and, and your radio next to that. So it was, wasn't was always in, in, the, in the stack. So that kind of thing sitting there in that kind of lounge room with the wood grain going on, yeah, it fits. So there you go. Yeah, way before even CDTV tried to pretend to be a piece of hi-fi, there's the Atari VCS doing it perfectly well. Um, I love the look of the new one. I didn't know it existed until I basically came across it on timeextension.com in a piece by Ashley Day. Uh, and it was after I'd finished researching last week's mech story, actually. So that's how I sort of segued onto looking at the new one. So if you want to know more, please head over uh, again. Uh, note, uh, the links will be in the show notes. Give it a read. Another, as I've said, I want my CD TV uh, in a hi-fi stack where it belongs. My only problem now is... I want a new one in there as well. So last week we asked you, where and how did you first experience group or multiplayer gaming? Computer, console, or even games such as laser tag. And I've ended contest mode so we can have the results now. Um, I'll read the first one out. It's from Mega STE. And he says, MIDI maze on the Atari ST sometimes Sometime around 1987, the original first-person shooter. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's a, a, It really is a first-person shooter in a game with bouncing smiley faces, and it connects up to 16 Atari STs through the MIDI ports. And that's wow. how you, you play this game. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's incredible. I never heard anything about it at the time. Uh, but yeah, um, incredible thing. He's, uh, there's a link there for it as well. Uh, Reese, what's next? You're going to make me read out this username, aren't you? Um, well, Tester de murder. Tester de murder. Tester de murder. Let's go with that. Um, so it says, uh, bedroom, spy versus spy, mid-80s, Atari 800XL. And there's a, a mic drop emoji. And then it says, edit. And actually, a family game of Scream In board game in early 80s. We counting board games? Never got better than that. Are we counting board games? We never, we yeah. never ruled them out. Does he? Why not? Why not? Yeah, I've yeah. never heard of that one. Screaming. Looks interesting. Hey. Heard of that? There's a link there. We can look at that. Cool. Mm. Um, so the third answer is from Generation Pixel. Oh boy, 1993 Championship Manager on the far superior Atari ST where me and my mates would play in almost all-nighters, all-weekend sessions, brokering deals face-to-face, smack-talking and shady backstabbing were all part of the course. Definitely some of my favourite weekends, even as a 20-year-old, uh, which just goes to show Dave is justified in his defence of the mighty ST. Do you guys defend mighty. the ST? I don't think you feel the need to defend it, do you? Shouldn't need to. It just speaks for itself, to defend it. it. Yeah, it speaks for Quality itself. speaks for itself. Um, should be able to mention it without Amiga fans going, yeah, but the Amiga. Okay. Exactly. Uh, there's more answers there if you'd like to go and see it. There's a, a Limey Tank talking about Horizons, uh, which is the, the, the pack in tape in the Spectrum. Guybrush Love Tesla talks about Jeff Crammon's Formula One Grand Prix in the Amiga. Um, Bubble Bobble chalks away. 
Um, I'm not really sure we're talking about bubble, but um, anyway, um, Rally Speedway, Beachhead Two, Two, it went a few two-player games. They were really aiming for more kind of um, multiplayer games. But thank you very much for all the answers, and we'll now move on to this week's question of the week. Reese is going to ask this week's question of the week. Tell us what it is, Reese. Okay, so my question for you is. Uh, what game do you think is most enhanced by playing it in the living room on the TV as opposed to being sat on your own at a PC? Okay, simple enough. Um, go work? to the subreddit, www.reddit.com slash r slash this week in retro to submit your answers. Thank you very much for listening. We will be back next week. I think Neil will be with us next week and we're going to have another guest. Um, thank you very much for coming on, Reese. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Reese runs um, two things, three things really. He's got a website, but he also runs his YouTube channel and he runs his podcast now. Mm. Um, I really do enjoy Reese's podcast. It comes out on a, a Friday night at midnight. So if I haven't gone to bed yet, I'll sneak a listen to that before the morning. Uh, Reese rambles. Uh, but thank you very much for coming on. I'm sure you'll be on again in the future. Um, and that's us. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Chris is waving. I know Reese is waving. Bye bye, folks. Everybody's waving. This week in retro was presented by Neil from RMC The Cave, Chris from 005 Agema, and Dave. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available to your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch this week in retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.